My name is Anthony, and this is my Norse Pagan journey. And today, I'm here to talk to you guys about a little trip that I went on, and it was magical. It was by far one of my favorite trips I've taken since I've been in Europe. Uh, I went to a little bit into Denmark, and then into Sweden, and then into Norway. And I can understand why the Scandinavians love their heritage, and I can understand why the stories uh, and the lore about our gods and goddesses and all of the sagas are written the way they are because it was so magical, so beautiful. Uh, but without further ado, I'm just gonna hop right into this and I'm gonna hit every little spot that I stopped, uh, not every little spot, the big spots that I stopped and give a little brief history on them, show some pictures here in the corner and we'll just go from there. So without further ado, like I just said, Let's get this one rolling. So just a little bit, uh, I do have my notebook here. I did take a lot of notes for this. Uh, I'm going to be reading a lot of my notes. That way I don't get anything wrong or anything mixed up for you guys. I want it to be uh, as historically accurate as, as can be. I did get my sources uh, from being there and also did have to do my own research as well. But uh, the first place that I stopped, uh, that I really want to hit on was Old Uppsala in Sweden. Uh, they also call it Gamla Uppsala. Um, we find the sources that we can find it from are the Engling Saga. We can find it from Adam of Bremen, who was a Christian that traveled there, I'm pretty sure from Germany. And he talks about what he witnessed. And then we also have Saxo Grammaticus. Uh, all three of these sources do hit on Uppsala and they do give us a lot of hit backs, uh, background and I guess like a history into what happened there. And we still have some of these sources today. Uh, so within Saxo Grammaticus, uh, it's stated that Odin himself had resided there at one point. Uh, but then Snorri, uh, that we've talked about before, Snorri Storlesen, the, uh, he stated that Freyr lived there and founded two institutions here, Uppsala, Od, Od, and the temple at Uppsala. Uh, so, there's two different lores there. There's two different stories there. So really, we don't know exactly who who they think lived there or was there or whatever. But those are two, uh, Freyr and Odin are two that they, when I was there, I also saw that there was, hey, you know, this is what this guy said. This is what this guy said. Um, so uh, Saxo Grammaticus also states that Freyr is the reason that they started doing uh human sacrifices there if you guys have ever seen the vikings tv show i know i hate talking about it but there was a bit of uh old Uppsala in the vikings tv show if you guys remember i'm pretty sure it's in like season one or two where uh they all go up and on top of this hill is this big like a hall i guess you could say a big building uh, and in adam of bremen describes it as uh the sacrifices as in this temple built entirely of gold, the people worship three gods. So uh, we we hear about this being there in the temple that or the gods that they, uh, I guess you could say, worship there were Odin, Thor, and Freyr. So again, Freyr and Odin. So, you know, that's, that's a little bit of that. But uh, when you watch the Vikings TV show, like I said, you see that big hall up there, and it's where they take Athelstan, the Christian and monk that they got from England, and he finds out that he's supposed to be sacrificed there. Uh, they end up not sacrificing him, spoiler alert, but uh, that is Uppsala. That's, that's, you know, everybody went there, and it also says in here, I seem to find it, uh, uh, a general festival was held for all of the provinces of Sweden, of Sweden uh, at Uppsala every nine years. Uh, I also saw in my in my work and in my research that some people would take, uh, like if they had already been Christianized, I guess you could say, uh, when that started coming into play, they would pay their way out of having to go to this. Uh, some of them did. Some of them that didn't want to be Christians still went, you know. Um, but, and then it also states, this is uh, Saxo, yeah, still Saxo Grammaticus. Uh, he states that the sacrifices are as follows. Of every kind of male creature, nine victims are offered, and the blood was used to appease the gods. Bodies are hung in a grove adjacent to the temple. There are even dogs and horses hung by human beings. Uh, you also see this in that TV show. 
uh, like I said, I hate referring to it, but it is a way to kind of help visualize it. Uh, so when I was there, there was the mounds, the burial mounds. Uh, I talk about that. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, there was the burial mounds that were uh, of higher nobility. That's what I want to say. Uh, they're of higher nobility that were there. And these burial grounds just kind of, they were, they were just hills. And you, you see it in the picture here. Uh, but there was a little plaque, and I didn't take a picture of it because I was too busy reading it. Uh, and there was a little grove that went down. And there was an old, old tree in there, a very big tree. And they, historians, uh, some historians think that that is where the offerings were given. Uh, that's where the sacrifices were given. Uh, we don't know. We don't 100% know. Uh, but it was really awesome to be there to actually see it. Uh, I did get some time to sit, uh, well, stand, and kind of just... Uh, I wouldn't say meditate, but kind of just be quiet, be silent. My wife and kid walked ahead of me and I got to kind of just think and be like, you know, what would it have been like to be one of the original uh, ancestors that, you know, followed our gods and worshipped our gods. And, uh, you know, it was very breathtaking. It was very humbling to be able to stand there where ancestors have been before and just kind of think about, you know, all of these different things. Uh it was, it was, it was awesome. If you ever get a chance, you need to stop there. It was awesome. Uh, that it's, it's, there's a museum there as well. There's also a, uh, I think it's called Old Odensburg or Odensboro. It's a, uh, it's a little like bar, you know, place where you eat restaurant, you can get food, but they serve mead. Uh, didn't get to go in. It wasn't open at the time when I got there because I got there early. Uh, and it was also raining. So, you know, you know how that goes. Uh, so, then the next spot, uh, I'm going to hit on it really fast. I don't have any pictures of it, unfortunately, uh, was, again, Bjorn Ironside's grave. Uh, I did see the runestone from very far away, so far away that I couldn't get a very good picture of it. It was also still raining because it was the same day uh, of Uppsala. But uh, we went and we tried to find it and we had to walk through the woods and walk through all these different uh, things. And there was a nature reserve right beside it. But when we got to the point where it said it should be, uh, there was like tape and stuff like a fence around uh, all of these hills and I was like oh it's got to be right over here so we went down to this road and we started following this path well this tape and stuff was telling you not to go over there don't go over here well come to find out all of those hills were also burial mounds uh, and then at the top of the highest hill once I finally got almost parallel or uh, not parallel almost straight across from where Bjorn Ironside's grave should have been uh, I saw it. Uh, I did see it, and it was pretty cool. Like I, I gave an offering uh, at at his grave, not right at it, because like I said, I couldn't go up to it. But I saw it from afar. Uh, I stuck it in a tree. Uh, I had an orange. I sliced it up, stuck it in the tree, said a few words to the ancestors, to Bjorn Ironside, uh, who they think is you know one of the kings of Sweden, and we kind of, I kind of went from there. And then I couldn't really stay too long because. It, I mean, there was nothing to do. My kid was getting bored. So I kind of just did my offering as my wife and son walked away, did my offering and went from there. And it was, it was, again, it was very magical, um, very humbling as well. Like I said before, uh, I got to just sit there and just, or stand there and just kind of talk to the ancestors, talk to the gods a little bit, you know, and just really try to become so centered into where I was and what was going on around me. And, um, uh, like I said, if you ever get a chance, you can see it from afar. You can also see the burial mounds. I did see a little plaque that said these are burial mounds. Uh, that was actually inside of the tape, so I couldn't really get a good picture of that either, but I could read it from pretty far away. So it was, it was, you know, it was a dis disappointing to not be able to go up to it. But again, I want to preserve that, that history that's there. I want to preserve all of that kind of stuff. So I really am okay with only seeing it from afar. Um, but that brings me on to my next spot, which is, a nun's hug. Uh, I know the the pronunciation is horrible. I'm sorry. Uh, you bear with me on it uh, with a lot of these. Uh, but what that was, it was also in Sweden. Uh, it was only like 30, 45 minutes from where Bjorn Ironside's grave was. About an hour, maybe an hour and a half from Uppsala. It's a burial mound with runestones. Uh, if you guys watched my Denmark video, you guys saw the boat-shaped uh, burial mounds. They were also here. Uh, this is the largest burial mound in Sweden. Uh, it's 200 feet in diameter and 30 feet high. 
Uh, the mound was huge. You could actually they had steps leading up to it. I walk up to the top. Uh, there's I'm gonna show a picture here of what it looked like. It was it was awesome. Uh, it's believed to be the burial ground for King Anund, uh, who was a Swedish king from the House of Ingling. So again, the Ingling saga from Uppsala. Uh, so we see these these Swedish uh, sagas and all these sagas kind of pulling in together to a couple of these places that I went to. Uh, so the runestone here reads. Folk vid raised all of these stones after his son, Hedin, Hedin, a nun's brother, Vred, carved the runes. Uh, and you can see this rune stone is huge. Uh, it's probably like 10, maybe like 9, 10 feet in, in height. Uh, it was huge and it was awesome to see. Uh, and also in front of it, uh, along the way, I didn't notice this until actually I did my history about it and did my reading uh, from the pamphlets and stuff and stuff that I took, pictures that I took, because it was downpouring when I was here. Uh, there was stones that they replaced in the 60s. Uh, but the rune stone was still there. And along this path was a path that the kings would take to get here. Uh, they also, it was held, uh, the thing or the ting were held here. Uh, and it was supposedly like a very important place. And they would also stop there on their way to Uppsala, some of the kings. Uh, so at the foot of the hill, there are two large stone ships. One are 177 feet long and 100, the other one is 167 feet long. They are huge. Uh, you can see them from up top on the picture that I'm going to show. You can see from up top down onto them and they are huge. I also took a picture like... I kind of went beside one of the stones and took a picture, uh, trying to preserve what is there. I don't want to walk all over them. I saw people walking through them. It really upset me. Uh, but that was also awesome to just be there again uh, and just kind of take my time, stroll through it. Yeah, it was downpouring, but I took my time. So my hood's up in every picture from Sweden. But it was it was amazing. It was so much fun. So much. I enjoyed it so much. It was a, a delight. I got to, like I said, humbled. You know, it, it, it was amazing. I, I'm speechless for what all these things that I see. Uh, I'm so lucky to have seen these things. Uh, so next, the next spot that I went to, uh, we drove from Sweden over to Norway. Uh, took a little pit stop in Oslo, got some Starbucks, you know, did some of that kind of stuff. Uh, let the kid walk around my see the boats. And then uh, we went about six, six and a half hours west to where... A lot of the fjords are in Norway. Uh, the fjord here that you see in this picture is the, again, pronunciation, I am sorry, Neroy Fjord uh, is the fjord here. It was remarkable. I, I don't have words that can describe the beauty of this, of this fjord, of this place. It, it was magical. There's waterfalls running off the side of the mountain, uh, like off the side of the cliff, I guess you could say. It was really a cliff. Uh, but the way, like, the, it, it, I tagged it on Instagram and it literally said, Gudvangen, most beautiful place in the world. And by far, it may just be the most beautiful place in the world. Uh, it was, it was amazing. And there's also a Viking village there. Uh, reenactors are in there. Reenactors are in there. Um, and they're very knowledgeable. I went into it, um, and you can see it. I have pictures here. I will show them as well. And it was remarkable. Uh, the the man, the the Jarl that was there, he uh, started this village, I think, probably like 20-some years ago. Uh, and it was just a project because people told him he looked like a Viking. Or It was one of the articles I read about him. And I got to talk to him and meet him. And um, my kid actually bought... Because he's, uh, if you listen to the podcast, we talked about how I wear my Mjolnir and my son always asked me for one just like it. Well, when we were in Uppsala, we found him a tiny one that looks just like this one. And he was ecstatic. He wore it the entire trip. Because uh, this is only day two of the trip when we went to Uppsala and he wore it the entire trip. So he uh, walked in there with it on and the Jarl saw it and the Jarl loved it. Uh, the Jarl thought it was amazing. He was a very good guy, very knowledgeable. Let us look at his uh, his little statues of his gods. Let us look at his axe, his helmet, you know, all these different things. Uh, and then we also got to see uh, the different areas in the place. He said the, the tour guide, when I listened to the tour, said, you know, the Viking village wouldn't be this big in real life because there's not that much room for a lot of people here. 
Uh, but these people that reenact, they actually live there. Uh, I think they live there a lot of the time, probably not during the winter because it, it's so cold up there in Norway. It was only in the 50s. Literally, it was, you drive south and it just kept getting warmer and it was wild. Uh, I mean, that's normally what happens, but still. Uh, and like looking at the Viking houses, excuse me, the houses that they had, the halls that they had there, and then looking out and just seeing the the fjord there and seeing the mountains coming down into the water and like it, it i could kind of picture what it would have been like to live back then uh i'm not saying that that's what i want to do i don't want to not saying i want to live back then you know but uh or that i'm a viking and not saying that one bit uh but all i'm saying is that like i kind of picture it and i i really had some time to sit there and talk to the gods uh the the viking village the name of it is Njordheimr, uh, and it's in respect to Nord, Njord, the god of the sea. Uh, you know, he's the father of Freya and Freya. And I thought that was pretty interesting because uh, when the tour guide talked to us, he was kind of saying how, like, the name of the town that they were in, Ner Nerofjord, they, it, it literally means island in the fjord, but there's no islands in that fjord. So, they the, the tour guide was kind of like does it translate to Njord? they don't know they, they it's it's not historically proven none of it is it was just his speculation and i was kind of like you know what that's sounds about right i take i'm i'm gonna put my money on what you just said but uh but uh the village reenactors are lifelike uh they dress like what the vikings are known to have dressed like not what you see in popular culture or popular media um the tours were awesome. They were knowledgeable. Uh, they had the blacksmith. They had animals walking around. You could do axe throwing and shoot a bow and an arrow. Uh, they also had god poles. Uh, you can see them here in the picture. They had god poles uh, in two different spots. The first spot was just a little area where they had... Uh, who did they have? I have it written down. Njord, Thor, Odin, Freya, and Freyr. Uh, and then... They discussed them, you know, uh, the, the tour guide did a little bit. And then after the tour was over, I took myself to the other side of the of the camp or of the village. And there they had a sacrificial area. Um, and they actually, or uh, offering area. Because I had talked to the blacksmith there via Instagram, actually. Uh, and he was like, you know, we, that is our, our offering area. We do have, actually do offerings. And I could tell because they had melted candles on it. There was still some sticks and some deer antlers and stuff like that. Uh, and that was awesome. That was that was really cool to see. They had some god poles there. You can see them in the picture here. And it was, it was awesome to see that. I kind of just stood there and talked to the gods a little bit because I'm in this most beautiful place I've ever seen. And I just wanted to talk to the gods and just kind of be like, you know what? Like this, I thank you. Like for the beauty of this, just, I thank you for letting me see this beauty. Like, I, it, I didn't even know this place existed, this this fjord. I didn't know it existed until I did a Google search of it. Uh, and I found it and I was like, wow, this place is amazing. Uh, and I just wanna give a shout out to them over there, Viking Village, or how do you say their name? Njardarheimer. Uh, and I, I just wanna thank them for the awesome experience. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to share this to them as well and tell them, like, send them a sh message on Instagram and tell them, like, hey, I'm shouting you out in my, my YouTube video because uh, it is. It was awesome. Uh, after we went there and the drive home was magical as well. I think my I, I think we had a sign. At least I think it's a sign. Uh, we had some wild reindeer run across the road and that was <laughs> breathtaking. Never seen them before. Never seen wild reindeer or in the wild, you know. I've seen them at like a zoo or something, but I've never seen them in the wild. And that was phenomenal. Uh, just to see them run across the road and just stand there in the middle of the road. And, like, it, it had to have been a sign from some god or goddess or an ancestor or a spirit or something. Somebody gave me a sign. And the rest of the drive home was just nice and calm. It was getting dark out, nice and chill. You know, everything was awesome. And I, I really enjoyed it. That was probably my one of my favorite parts of the trip uh was that fjord you know everything was equally beautiful everything was awesome but this place was just phenomenal uh, and then to have the village there as well was even even more phenomenal uh 
But after we left there, uh, I guess it was getting dark. So we started heading towards the Burgund Stav or Stave Church. Uh, and this is a church that was built between 1180 and 1250. So this is during the time when the Christians were trying to uh, reform Scandinavia, trying to make the pagan people or the heathens Christians. Uh, and you can tell in the picture here, uh, if you look at it, there's a mixture of crosses and dragons, uh, which represents the Norse pagan and the Christian, uh, which is pretty awesome. Uh, at this time, when this was built, you got to think, the population of people, a lot of them were still Norse pagan. Um, and they, they, some of the research that I did says that they did this in spite. They put the dragons there in spite. Uh, some say that, you know, the Christians let them do it because then it helped them, you know, hey, we're, we're very giving people. Uh, we're understanding, you know, put your dragons but you're still going to follow Christianity, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I couldn't go inside. Uh, it was closed by the time I got there, unfortunately. I wanted to because there is a rune inscription inside. And the rune inscription inside says, Thor wrote these runes in the evening at the St. Olav's Mass. So there is still Norse pagan in that church. Uh, it's a beautiful church. It, it, you can tell that it's old. It's, it, I've seen it on Instagram a ton of times and I had to stop there. I was on my way back from uh, the the fjord up there and I just, uh, I, I had to stop and we did and it was beautiful. It's also in the mountains and it, it, was, it was just beautiful. Um, and then after that, we went back down to Denmark. We took a ferry down the water, down over to Denmark. Uh, and I went back to, if you watch my Denmark video, I went back to a spot uh, called Jelling, where the Jelling runestones are. Uh, and if you want to see those runestones, I didn't actually go out there. It was downpouring again, uh, but I didn't actually go out to those runestones. But I have pictures of them on my Instagram, and I have pictures of them on the YouTube video about Denmark. Um, but there is a new part of the exhibit inside the museum that's there with another runestone that they found in the wall of the church that is there. Like I said, a church. I told you, they put them everywhere, trying to Christianize, you know, Scandinavia. So this runestone that you see here, uh, they really don't know much about what what this runestone's for. Uh, the name is Basse or Bass or ba Bassi uh, made this monument. That's what it says. That's what this runestone says. Uh, but they don't know who he was. They don't know who this guy was. And like I said, they found it in the wall of the church. So it's like, did they build that on top of his room stone? Or did they put it in there when they made the church, you know, like in spite again? Or because they were being understanding? I, I don't know. Nobody really knows. They just know that they found it in the wall of the church. They excavated it. And this is what they have. Uh, and it was amazing. I'm also going to throw up a couple pictures here uh, just randomly throughout while I'm talking now of some little pieces of the new exhibit that they had there as well. Um, and then now also after that, I'm going to show some more pictures from, uh, the museum in Uppsala because I forgot to mention earlier when I talked about Uppsala that there is, uh, some of their excavation findings and they are beautiful. Uh, if you look, uh, at the picture with the helmet, you can still see some of the very intricate designs on the helmet. Uh, the sword is still standing very well. Uh, like it was, it, it was amazing to see these things. So... Uh, that is my Scandinavian adventure. Uh, thank you guys for watching this video. Uh, it was an amazing trip. I recommend Scandinavia for anybody. It was an amazing trip. I want to go back, uh, specifically Norway. I do have Norwegian blood. Uh, so I do want to go back there and explore a little bit more. I want to go see the Northern Lights. I did, excuse me, did not get to see the Northern Lights. That was one thing I tried to do, but that was 18 hours north where the snowstorms were happening. Not, not, not a good time. I think I'm just going to fly there next time. Uh, but uh, thank you guys so much for watching this video. This was an amazing trip. If you guys want to ask me any questions about anything that I saw, if you want to ask me any questions about anything Norse paganism, Norse, about Norse paganism in general, let me know. Hit me up on email. It's mynorsepaganjourney at gmail.com. 
Instagram is my Norse Pagan Journey. Facebook is my Norse Pagan Journey. You can hit me up. You can join the Discord. It is in the link in my Instagram bio. And the Discord is the My Norse Pagan Journey Discord. We also have a podcast that we started. I think we've done two episodes now. Uh, and it's very hard for us to get, you know, all together because we all have kids. We all have life going on. We all work. So uh, we're going to come out with another episode here either this week or next week. And that is on all major podcast platforms. And it is the My Norse Pagan Journey podcast. Uh, and I just, like I said, I just want to thank you guys so much for supporting me for all through all of this. Uh, through everything that I've been through, everything that we have been through as a community, everything that everyone here has been through. Uh, thank you for just being there for me. Thank you for being there and watching my videos. Thank you for being there. And I hope that I'm helping you guys along your journey. Because like I always say, as long as I can help one of you, one Norse pagan on their journey, then my goal is complete. So thank you guys again for watching this video. If you, like I said, if you have any questions, go ahead and let me know, please. And I will answer them to the best of my ability. Or I will put you in contact with someone that might know a little bit more about that. Like, sh uh, let's say shamanism or the runes. I'm not very, I know the runes. I know, I, I can do my research and know what they mean. Uh, but I'm not skilled in them. I will put you in contact with someone who is. Some stuff like that, okay? So, guys, again, thank you so much for watching. Uh... And my name is Anthony, and this is my Norse Pagan Journey.